Hi, this is Josh Blackman. I am the president of the Harlem Institute, and it's my honor to welcome you to the 2020 Harlem Institute Ashbrook Virtual Supreme Court Competition. This year, we're arguing the case of Torres versus Madrid. Uh, this will be match number eight. Uh, this will be a shortened match because the petitioner team, unfortunately, was not able to attend. Uh, so we only have the respondent team participating. We have Katie Gatowski and Leighton Schur, and they'll be arguing on behalf of the respondents in Torres versus Madrid. Counselor, you have 15 minutes. You can begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. I'm Leighton Schur. And I'm Katie Gatowski, and today we represent the respondent in the case of Torres v. Madrid. As the counsel for the petitioner has uh, not already addressed the facts of the case, we uh, expected they were going to, um, we won't move directly into our argument. So uh, we wanted to bring to light that this case was about to, uh, two officers trying to detain a suspect that were ultimately unsuccessful and had to discharge their weapons when a car was driving straight towards them that was operated by the suspect. They then discharged their weapons, weapons in attempt to protect themselves and stop the suspect, but were ultimately unsuccessful because that suspect, being Miss Torres, kept driving and was not apprehended until a day later. So uh, now we will move directly into our argument that a Section 1983 excessive force claim grounded in the Fourth Amendment cannot be made in absence of physical control of the suspect because without physical control, there can be no seizure. A seizure occurs when a police officer acquires physical possession, custody, or control of a suspect, as established in the cases of Brower v. County of Inyo, Terry v. Ohio, United States v. Mendenhall, and Tennessee v. Garner. The case of Hadari D. deals with show authority at the time when a seizure was in question and bears less apl applicability to the case at hand than the previous cases I mentioned. So, Counselor, your team on the other side, at least in their brief, contends that uh, Hodari D controls this case. Do you think Hodari D controls our decision here? So, uh, not at all. And we actually have three reasons as to why it does not. Uh, may I present those reasons? Please. So firstly, we argue that this claim made by Scalia that the petitioners rely so heavily upon is in fact dicta. Now, this is because the case was about the admissibility of evidence. And in doing so, they had to determine if this rock of cocaine was the fruit of an unlawful seizure. So this rock of cocaine was discarded by the suspect when he was running away from the officer. So they had to determine that if when he was running away, he was seized. And they determined firstly, that this was not a Caesar, seizure. This show of authority was in fact not a seizure. The only part of uh, Scalia's statement that was binding was that common law defines a seizure. And this was because in determining if he was seized when he was running away, they had to look to common law. Anything after this point is considered dicta because it was non-binding or not necessary to the holding or the final outcome of the case. Now, secondly, even if it is believed that this statement is not dicta, it becomes dicta when trying to apply it to the case. Well, let's hand. just let's just assume that we're saying it's it's just dicta. Are you saying Justice Lee was wrong? Maybe we should, are we saying we should ignore him? Oh, we are not saying that we should. Maybe it's a question for for Katie. Uh, I put this question to Katie. I mean, is, is Justin Scalia maybe wrong? Maybe are you think we should ignore him? Well, what we're saying is we agree with the holding in Hodari that uh, seizure means the taking possession and that common law dictates seizure uh, to the extent that it's applicable. Um, but when you're taught, uh, and those are relevant to, because those were relevant to the decision in that case. But the non-binding statement was in in uh, in Hodari D is that this seizure is uh, affected by the slightest application of physical force because this is simply not true and it's not backed by other Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and nor is it backed by the actual common law itself. So and which so, which 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 common law authorities are you guys relying on for your for your side? Uh, right. So. Uh, traditional common law meaning of the word seizure equates seizure to an arrest as, as, our, as, the, petition, uh, as the counsel for the petitioner brought up in their brief. Uh, 
However, there are no common law cases where there, that involve a seizure by shooting or, or any other projectile, only instances of laying on of hands, as you see in the, case, the 1704 case of Genevieve Sparks, which is these, in, these English debt collection practices that Hodari D relies so heavily on in, in its discussion of common, the, common, the, mean, the common law meaning of seizure. Uh, and even if you were to refer to the 1604 Countess of Rutland case, you see that uh, this countess, she was touched with the end of an inanimate object being a, a mace, which is indirect force. Uh, and but then she she was uh, she submitted. She was compelled to be taken to the compter. So we see that all common law seizures through the use of inan inanimate objects also involved a submission. So even here, where touch implies some some level of physical control, because touching inherently impedes movement or, or harms in the integrity of the, of the person. A flying object merely coming into contact with, with a person's body does not. Uh, for instance, uh, if a person were to throw a stuffed animal at, at me or, or, or rather at another person, that that's obviously not a seizure, even if it falls under this slightest application of physical force. So while the counsel for the petitioner could argue that common law establishes this Fourth Amendment's protection of the body through touch, there are no examples where it provides for the protection from indirect force without submission. And so because common law doesn't answer this question, Your Honor, we must look internally to how this court has ruled outside this limited context of, of common law to deal with, with, with the very much changed practices of our modern police force. But counsel, what, how do you respond to petitioner's hypothetical argument that uh, the Fourth Amendment is supposed to prohibit uh, the state action, not the defendant's reaction to whatever that state action is? So in, in your example, let's say that we're not talking about throwing a teddy bear, but throwing you know a rock at someone. And you have one potential defendant who goes down and, and this rock takes them out. And then you have another defendant who it just sort of dings off of them and they keep going. Why are those protections for those two different defendants different? Well, they're different because of the level of control that is there. So if you have a stoppage, then that officer has restrained the ability of that person to leave. And we can look to uh, the, the test that Mendenhall provides, uh, which is which dictates that a person is seized only if in view of the surrounding the circumstances surrounding the incident, a reasonable person would not would have believed that he was not free to leave. So the person that was taken down by the rock would have been seized because they, they were not free to leave. And as uh, Tennessee v. Garner uh, elucidates this, this free to leave test that when an officer restrains the freedom of a person to walk away. So you need the officer restraining that the freedom of the person to walk away because then you know that the officer has control over that person, even if it's for a limited amount of time, that's achieving the state interest of, of having control over the, the, the subject that you're trying to have, um, which is much more, which is much different than than someone who was wasn't affected by by the rock. If the rock glanced off them, not not as with without as much force, and they were able to keep running. Council, it sounds like I mean I take your point about the common law cases not covering projectiles, and so maybe we could draw a common law line between a laying on of hands and the use of indirect force through projectiles, but that's not the line that you want us to draw. Is that right? That is correct. And instead, the line that you want us to draw would, I mean, do you agree that it would be less protective of rights than the common law was because it would find no seizure in circumstances where common law cases would have deemed physical contact to be an arrest? That's uh, a great, that's a great question. Thank you. So not at all. Uh, we believe that uh, stuff outside the realm of a seizure when it hasn't considered uh, that a seizure has occurred, that actually falls under the due process clause under the 14th Amendment. We know that physically abusive governmental conduct that shocks the conscience of the court, as established in Sacramento v. Lewis, um, allows the due process clause to be invoked. And now, uh, taking this quote from Sacramento v. Lewis, we see that anything outside the context of a seizure, you know, this being when there was no stoppage, when there was no restraint of liberty, a person injured, this being Torres, can prosecute with a substantive due process claim. So no, we do not believe that it changes the protections that our founders um, intended to establish. And furthermore, what we don't want to do is use the Fourth Amendment as a solution to a problem outside of seizure, therefore expanding the intent of what the Fourth Amendment was supposed to cover. 
So counsel, let me give you a hypothetical, right? Let's say instead of shooting a projectile or a teddy bear or anything like that, the police here did something different. They knew she was driving on the highway at 75 miles per hour. They called ahead and told their partners to put up a roadblock, a spent roadblock in the middle of the highway. It's late at night, it's dark. Uh, she can't see it. She slams into the roadblock and destroys her car, right? Wrecks her car. Is that a okay. seizure? Yes, it is. And you see that that is, that's the case of what happened in Brower. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, now I'm gonna change the hypo, right? She slams into the roadblock, destroys her car, then she gets out and starts running on foot. Is there a seizure? I would say yes, because she was seized for the time that she was stopped. But, but so, her, so whose liberty are we talking about being halted? Is it the liberty of the car or the liberty of the person? In other words, what's the test you guys are looking at? Well, uh, when the liberty of a person is infringed upon, and we actually saw what this liberty was clarified by, um, you know, uh, Tennessee v. Garner and Terry v. Ohio, Brendlin, and even Brower and Mendenhall, uh, when they do not have a sufficient, when they're not able, for whatever that instant may be, to make a sufficient intervening act of free will. But again, my, are, my hypo counselor, she wrecks the car, opens the door, starts running on foot. Was she seized? I would have to say in that instant that uh, she was seized for the moment she was stopped. When the law enforcement have a moment, a momentary amount of control, a momentary amount of stoppage, that is a seizure. In the case that is presented to us today, that moment, that moment of stoppage, that moment where she can't make that act of free will being continuing driving is not present because she was driving away this whole time. And this is completely analogous to the case decided by the 10th Circuit Court of Brooks v. Genzel. A suspect was shot injuring someone and the, the petitioners were arguing that that infringed upon the liberties of that person, although it was decided that it did not because the bullet did not allow the government to have any sort of control over the suspect. All right, all right counsel, we'll, oh, no, Justice Tables, so please go ahead. I was to say, what about the fact that Ms. Torres's left arm was paralyzed by the shots? I mean, is that not a meaningful restriction on her, on her freedom of movement? Um, well, first of, first of all, that uh, paralysis was actually temporary and seemingly only lasted for the time she was in the car and then uh, secondly, we look to the fact that the main factor in all these cases, even in Hadari, that the petitioner relies heavy, heav heavily upon, excuse me, and the common law cases established that are founding is this factor of stoppage. We believe that when the government has control over the suspect and they cannot make that sufficient intervening act of free will, that being running away or doing or fighting the officer, that is when they're seized. It's when they have stopped, when they have conceded. But how do you reconcile that with your earlier statement that at any moment of control, however slight, would be enough? So wouldn't that paralysis be a seizure? Well, no, because she was still continuing to move. They don't have control over a suspect if she is still moving away in the car. The example uh, Justice Blackman gave us stated that she did in fact stop for a moment because the car crashed into a barrier. That momentary stoppage as seen in Brower is what actually completes that seizure because in Brower- Counselor, the I, uh, Sorry, your time's running short. I wanna get this question in, but doesn't that reward people with superhuman strength? You know, If you were to shoot me, I would fall in one shot. I'm not driving anywhere, right? Uh, you know, maybe Justice Tableson will, you know, start driving a million miles, but I'm down for the count, right? Doesn't this reward people of superhuman strength? Like if you're Chris Hemsworth, you're good, right? But, you know, if you're Bruce Banner, you're not, right? I mean, doesn't, isn't, isn't there a problem that you, you're making it based on a person's ability to withstand severe amounts of pain and keep moving? Isn't that your test? And this um, for, perhaps for Katie to, to, to uh, uh, for this question? Well, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding the question, but I don't think it would be a problem at all if, if the person were were to submit to the the officers if they were if the if they had the intention to stop them and the, then obviously the the natural state interest would be for them to be stopped and to have them under the officer's control so if you're if you're looking to 
to uh, determine what the Constitution is is attempting to do with with the Fourth Amendment and, and attempting to protect with the Fourth Amendment, you you need to look at this this. There's a balance between the the individual the individual and the governmental interests, and so. If you if you decided in, in favor of either side of this court, I you you could find a way to protect this individual uh, interest to be protected from excessive force, either under making it fall under the the, the Fourth Amendment or making it fall under uh, under a, a due process excessive force claim. However, only by deciding in favor of the respondent can can you also protect the state interest to apprehend the suspect and and ensure that the definition of seizure is narrowly tailored to apprehending the suspect, not not just merely exerting force over them. There's no state interest in that. So if you want to protect this balance and stand by the years of precedent under the Fourth Amendment that's consistent with constitutional language, that, that's consistent with common law, and it's consistent with the precedent set by this court, then undoubtedly this should be a, a decision in favor of the respondent. Thank you. <laughs> right on time. Good job, counsel. Thank you. All right. You. Wow. Wow. That was good. Where's your coach? My coach, want to come back on camera? I see your, your uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, that was spectacular. Oh boy. Yeah. That was, wow. Blown away, blown away. You guys were throwing precedents around. You were handling our hypos. You did not give ground. I made a comment and then late and you came back to like five minutes later. That's not easy. That's impressive. At first I thought you meant the actual justice. Harry Black's like, no, he meant my question. Like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's impressive. Wow. That was great. Um, and you guys have a special treat. Uh, Rebecca, you may not know her name, but she works for the U.S. Solicitor General's office. And oh. she argued before the Supreme Court, Taurus versus Madrid. So Very you were wrong. getting the person who actually argued this case before the Supreme Court. And the question she was giving you were the same question she got and she prepped for. So that was, that was really special. Uh, I I know you were at a disadvantage because you have no petitioner team, but I didn't even notice you were responding to the arguments when they weren't here. This was, this was good. Uh, Rebecca and Sam, I hope you have some feedback from these wonderful students. Yeah, uh, you guys, I was, I was blown away. I mean, you're really good. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, and I like, I know a lot about this case, you know, uh, and so I, you know, your level of knowledge, substantive knowledge as to the facts, and the case law, I mean, like, Layton, you were rattling off cases, like all the important precedents. Katie, you're talking about Countess of Rutland, like a 1604 Star Chamber case. Um, I mean, that depth of knowledge was really, really impressive. Um, so, subs and, and you were also, I thought, making some of the most persuasive arguments on behalf of the respondent. We, the U.S. government, we were on the other side in this case. We were um, supporting the result for which the petitioner was advocating. But, um, you know, I think, you know, uh, you know, the respondent in this case has some challenges, uh, especially with Hodari D on the books. And I thought you guys were really hitting on the most persuasive points that you that you could have been. Um, then, you know, presentation-wise, you were both really smooth, really nice pacing, really good tone and eye contact, um, and making a good faith effort to answer directly the questions that you were getting, even those hard, annoying questions. Um, I, I thought you guys were really both awesome. And it's obviously hard to pass it back and forth between the two of you on Zoom, but even but given the difficulty of the setting, you were doing a great job at that too. Um, so congratulations. Like, Thank you so much. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, really nicely done, both of you, um, especially from the moment that you started talking, Leighton, you adjusted your introduction to the fact that people weren't here and doing that on your feet is a really difficult yeah, thing. Yeah, that, that messed me up. <laughs> yeah, Antis you know what? You would not have known because you just, you rattled off and said, you know, we thought they were gonna talk about the facts, but they didn't. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, you can only anticipate so much when you're on the respondent side. A lot of times you have to wait and listen to what 
but they're going to present that oral argument and adjust accordingly. And I thought you did that really well. Um, say, I have the same comments about your ability to switch off between you, your, uh, your rapport with one another. And both of you presented very confidently, very professionally, without, um, without getting to a point where you at any point overstepped a judge or, um, you know, you respectfully disagreed. Or Katie, there was an instance where you said, you know, perhaps I'm not understanding your question, but if I am, here's my response. I think it's a beautiful way to handle it if it seems like, you know what, maybe we're talking past each other a little bit. Um, and then giving the fact that you provided the judges with the alternative of, look, here is what the Fourth Amendment does. And if we start to get into this other discussion, um, this is a 14th Amendment due process problem. This is not a Fourth Amendment issue. I thought that was really effective because I have been in front of benches that very clearly did not want to make a decision on the issue that we we wanted before them. And in some instances, it's better to give the judges an out and to say, no, we're going to limit the scope of what you're doing here. You don't have to make this sweeping decision. You can consider this more tailored issue. So especially where you get into this, where do you draw the line problem? That was a really effective way to come at it. So I thought that was very yeah. good. Yeah, that I... Uh... This this was this was really special. I, I can tell how much work you did. I mean, Sacramento v. Lewis is not an obvious case to talk about here. I mean, that that record did they even come out of the court? Did anyone even ask about that? I can't remember. I don't believe. No, so. not that I recall. Definitely not me or the petitioners' counsel. I don't think the time. And, and I mean, the teddy bear. Um, did you come with that on the fly? Or did they have that ready in advance? I, I had said it a couple of times when we were practicing. Or, or... It sounded like you came with the fly. That was, that was really good. You know, with Teddy Brad hypothetical, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the mace, you know, the anatomy the, the of the Star Chamber case. Yeah, that, that was great. Um, Mr. Smith, that was really lovely. Your students are obviously well prepared. I know they good students have good coaches. So, so, so kudos to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, giving your time to uh, give uh, not just my students, but all students a chance to uh, do the sort of thing it is. Uh, you know, I'm sure you have can innovate other things to do with your Sundays. So uh, this, 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 this makes me happy. Uh, I was doing this all day yesterday. We had six matches yesterday. We had six matches today. Your match number two for today got, I think, four more after you. Uh, but this was special. Um, we'll be sending out the scores tomorrow uh, and announcing which teams will be advancing to the next round. So we'll be putting out the scores tomorrow. But but this competition just the, the teams are are so good. What you're doing here could be better than law students, right? You could be competing. In a law school mood court final, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Oh, this, thank you. You could be competing in a mood court, a mood court law school mm -hmm. final, uh, and you're what, 16, 17 years old? 17. I, I am. I mean, come on. Yeah, I'm 16. Six, oh, come on, 16. I, hey, Katie's a sophomore. I, I can do. I know any of this stuff. Um, I, I always like to give the students a chance to ask us questions. We're giving you a million questions for me, Rebecca, or Sam. Anything going about law school or about. Uh, the, the Supreme Court or about the Constitution, whatever you want to ask us, so you have free reign. And the other team's not here, so we have plenty of time because uh, uh, we don't have to rush as much. We usually do. I mean, I have a question. How do you how do you prepare for a, a going in to talk to the Supreme Court? That's, that's, that's a Rebecca question. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, it is so much work. I actually have my binder here that I was like asking you guys questions from. Um, so I... Um, I spent probably, I'm trying to think, maybe 180, 200 hours um, prepping uh, for this argument, which which was my very first Supreme Court argument. So I was also nervous, you know. But um, and that's quite different from what I've done in the courts of appeal, which are the the next lower down. On that, it's a much lighter list. But when you're arguing on behalf of the government in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, you really can't say anything wrong. Um, and so the downside risk of not knowing something, I, I felt pretty high because you don't wanna bind the United States government by making a representation to the Supreme Court that's incorrect. Um, so I, you know, in those 200 hours, I mean, I read every possible case. I read all the, you know, law review articles about the origins of the Fourth Amendment, all the common law cases. Um, to try to get what actually it seems like you guys had a pretty good hold of, which is like a, your bird's eye view of the whole legal landscape. You know, not just the language of Brower versus the language of Hodari D, but an understanding of how all of this fits in to the broader Fourth Amendment and the common law and, and the way the court was thinking about the Constitution. Um, and then I prepare like materials basically to have with me at argument. 
um, like notes and you know my introductory remarks and what cases I want handy and and things like that. And the preparation of the materials really helps refine your thinking about the case because it makes you focus on what's important and the points that you really want to get out there and that you want to go to uh, whenever you're able to because there are some things you want the Supreme Court to like hear. Um, so yeah, that's basically the process. It is a lot of work. And, and let me, I'll just go back to another compliment. You know, when you're a government lawyer, the brief, right, is read by hundred people. I mean, how many people probably reviewed the brief that you had? A, a lot, right? A lot, yeah. But, but lot. when you're doing the argument, it's just you, right? There, there's yeah. no one else. It's you and, and, you know, nine justices on Zoom or on the phone at least. Um, and, and so once you're up there, you're up there. They can't, you can't ask your boss for a, you know, a question. It's, it's you. And then the two of you were up there and, you know, handing, you can coordinate. You're not even in the same room and smooth, smooth, smooth. Thank you. Um, I had a question and this was just regarding, I saw you sent us an email. Uh, this is for you, Mr. Blackman, about uh, some, some uh, classes or something you were holding. Yes. And, and I didn't have too much time to look at, at it. Are those free and just allowed to be this is my up. class i'm a law professor that's my full-time job and i teach oh. a first amendment class a semester i have three classes left this semester if you want to come and watch on zoom you're welcome it's monday wednesday uh 2 30 eastern uh awesome. I, I think so cool. the, the zoom info so you should have that as well uh, but you're welcome katie layton uh, you're welcome to attend i may cold call on you because you're pretty good i may call on you for a question but uh you're welcome just to watch we're, we're actually covering the second amendment this week in class so i think cool. i think you enjoy it Awesome, thank you. My pleasure. What other questions do you guys have? Hmm. None, I, I can't seem you to guys, think of. Katie, I have you? a question. Do you guys, is anyone thinking about law school or being a lawyer? That's my, num yeah, that's really what I'm looking forward to doing. I'm hoping. I'm Very looking cool. to go into um, the criminal justice sector specifically because, you know, as you see in our landscape today, it's not going too well, so we got to fix it. Wow. So, something you... I have to say for Layton, just the uh, like they canceled a lot of the uh, upper level uh, um, honors uh, social studies courses in our school. And so uh, to make up for it through independent study, we bought a law school textbook and we had a girl last spring who did it. And then Layton is doing it this year, basically working through it, you know, doing legal history of the U.S. And then about a couple months ago, he switched to just preparing for this as you know part of his independent study coursework. And then Katie studied it in the context of our debate elective for sophomores. I have the kids vote on a, a current uh, Supreme Court case to uh, debate on, and uh, they picked this one. And she wrote the best paper in that class. And so I said, hey, Layton, you need a partner, and uh, I got somebody for you. And so then they've been working for the last month or so on coordinating how, the stuff. So how about you, Katie? What, what, what are you looking to do with your career? I mean, you're so young, of course, but what, what, what interests you? I don't know. I'm really, I'm really interested in English, and I, and I, I, I've had so much fun doing this too. So I could see myself like doing an English major and then going to law school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Layton, I am a criminal. I'm a federal prosecutor. Um, yeah. And so I work in criminal law mostly. I'm just actually on like a long. I mean, it's so long that it's hard to call it, a very long loan to the Office of the Solicitor General. But normally, I'm a federal prosecutor. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, it's it's very it's very cool. Um, and it's a nice balance of sort of the dorky legal side of it, which obviously I'm very into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also, there's a human, a real human part yeah. of the job where I'm yeah. working with the victims and and with criminal defendants and and juries, and so. It's a cool balance there, um, for whatever that's worth. Yeah. yeah, no, that's worth a lot. Thank you. All right. And also, I'm going to put my email address, um, which I think maybe at least one of you has, in the chat. If you ever have any questions about law school or anything else, you're, you're welcome to email me. If you have a question for Becca, I can, I'm happy to pass on any, or, or, or Sam, I'm happy to pass on to my colleagues. Um, but this, this was really, really good. I can tell you, you spend a significant amount of time prepping for this. It, it, it was just, it, it, was, it was really good. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Anything else, uh, Sam or Becky, you want to add for the for the students? No. Um, good luck, you guys. Uh, I feel like, you know, whatever you do, you're going to be awesome at because you really killed it a bit. So uh, it's nice to it's nice to meet you. And thanks for the time. Nice to meet you guys, thank too. You, thank Smith. you. I appreciate if you're coaching your students like this. It shows. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys job. for 
taking all the time to set this up and be here. It's this, is, this is what I live for. I love this stuff. Yeah. All right, guys. So if the students can please turn off their cameras, I'll stop the recording, then the judges can confer a bit and uh, we'll get ready for the next, uh, next round. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.